Welcome to Mobile Monday. And I understand it's been a while since we all got together again, but it's exciting that we can meet again. So tomorrow actually marks one year of mobile, this chapter of Mobile Monday, the Mobile Monday of Soccer chapter. And to celebrate that, courtesy of the Finnish Embassy, we got some visitors who came through to soccer and we managed to get the dates to go inside and to hold this meet, host this meeting for everyone. So one thing that we've been discussing and I think I hope everyone has managed to get a handout of where we hope to take Mobile Monday with your involvement is around the theme of connecting people to the future and that is connecting the people of Zambia, of Africa and the world to the future using technology and all this stuff. And it's interesting that the discussion that we will have today will set a, a lot around how that can be done and the practices uh, where it is being practiced and we hope that we can pick out from those ideas and learn and re-implement those ideas here in Zambia. Tonight's event is being moderated by Mr. Mark Bennett from iSchool. So as soon as I sit down, Mr. Bennett will come and uh, take the floor. But tonight's event is also hosted by Mobile Monday Osaka itself, uh, Bongo Hive, the Human Security, fin Human Security of Finland, and Topro, who have given their and the current sponsorship of the South African Innovation Support Program. So we will tend to get this thing started, so I'd like to welcome to the floor Mr. Bennett. Uh, I thought we couldn't finish with the finish. <laughs> so I thought we ought to start with, uh, with the Zambian at least. Also because we're going to hear some really good stuff here from Finland, but I just wanted to make sure that we got an advertisement in for the fact that actually Zambia is doing something as well uh, and is leading the way in Africa in terms of some of the development work that we're doing in education. So I'm going to just get that out of the way very quickly. I was going to ask you to put up your hands if you finish. But frankly, it might be better to put up your hands if you're Zambian. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Finnish? Finnish? See, that's a lot of people. And some other Scandinavians, probably. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the winter in Zambia, <laughs> which is probably still reasonably. Like Paris, but it does get dark here, and I know that's one of the differences. So I'm just going to very quickly take you through uh, what we've been doing uh, at iSchool. Uh, iSchool is essentially about uh, taking the whole of the Zambian primary curriculum uh, and making it available via um, Android devices. Uh, it's been a big project, we've spent a lot of money doing it, uh, and we are in fact just about to launch, so that you know that uh, what's out here. So very quickly, um, things, as everybody is aware, but particularly for, for the visitors, things in the continent generally are changing very quickly in terms of the connectivity that's available. So we're getting fibre creeping in all over the place. Um, we're getting mobile penetration up to sort of somewhere around 90%. Um, we're getting WiMAX, we're getting all sorts of other things going on. And at the same time, of course, that's now uh, coinciding with the arrival of low cost. I mean low cost, sort of $50 style. Um, sorry to anybody who's selling anything more than $50. Uh, <laughs> we are talking $50 type devices here. $30 smartphones, $50 tablets, that sort of thing. Which are very suitable for this environment and which would also work off solar power as well. Um, particularly bearing in mind that when we're looking at schools in this country, they tend to be in rural areas. The vast majority are in rural areas and the majority of them don't have mains electric power. So we are looking in many cases at certainly at primary education at places that need solar as well. Um, we've got a rapidly rising population. Um, we have to deal with the fact that a lot of children are now being educated in community schools. And in those community schools, 85% um, of teachers are untrained. So we've got a real mix of better quality in town and less better quality uh, in the rural areas. So. What we've been trying to do is to marry those two opportunities, a real problem with primary education in particular, 
A lot of people don't get beyond primary education anyway, so primary is where the real issue is. Um, so that, uh, that combined with, now what can we do with the technology uh, that we've got? So what we've done is to take the entire Zambian primary school curriculum, uh, which works out four hours a day, uh, 5,500 lessons in total. So very prescriptive saying, in this lesson today, which is the first Tuesday of the third term of grade four, this is what we're going to be doing in the class. And it, trying to move away completely from rote learning, memorized learning, which is what's going on in the vast majority of uh, institutions, to interactive inquiry-based child-centered learning. So we're saying, here are the resources you need, here's how we're going to set up the classroom, here's what we're going to do in terms of uh, group work, here's what we're going to do in terms of questions and so on. So you've got this three-page document in front of you, or of course it's on the tablet, and you're reading that as a script, and if you're doing that, that's good enough to be changing your teaching style. Because it isn't good enough just to give a tablet to some children and say, get on with it. We have to change the way that teaching is done at the same time. So we've got that built into it. And then we've got these uh, thousands of individual lessons, um, which are created for the students to be working in their uh, environment. And what you'll see is that they are specifically Africanized. Um, and we assume that we can do village experiments around the village fire for chemistry rather than have to go into a, into a chemistry lab. So they're all localized, contextualized, and we have translated all of the early grades into eight of the local languages. So in some cases, children now have got learning material of quality uh, in their own language, which they have never seen before. Uh, that includes, incidentally, uh, Town Nyanja, that's spoken here in Lusaka, which we even had to write the dictionary for, uh, because it's, it's different. Um, so that's a, a really good job that's been done. Um, and then the last component of it is that uh, there is <coughs> teacher training. So there's a one year teacher training course that sits on the tablet here as well. Um, and our methodology, which some, uh, there's Lulu here um, in the bright dress, who will talk to you afterwards. She's one of our teachers, uh, whose picture you've seen up here as well. She'll talk to you about the methodology that we adopt in the schools to change things away from here's 100 people to here's some groups that we can actually work with. If I can actually get that to work. This is home store is very busy. There are so many people in the market now. There are mothers with their babies. There are children playing. Local there are men and women who know where to work. Who else can you see in the market? So, sorry about the sound quality, but sort of fun, colourful, that, that would be understood uh, anywhere. And then, of course, the same thing, oops, same thing available in, uh, in all, well, that was, that was Bamba, for those who'd like to speak Bamba. That will uh, come out um, on the speakers at some later date. <laughs> okay, so out of all of those stories, that story then comes lots of other learning, um, uh, creative learning, maths, uh, language and so on, with the objective that we're trying to create school leavers who will come out of primary school able to think for themselves and work their way out of their situation and become far more economically empowered. Not just better at passing exams, uh, but actually thinkers. Just from a purely technical point of view, we do therefore need things that are very robust, designed for primary schools, can't assume mains power and so on. Good internet, if you've got it, that's fine, but if you haven't, you must work without it. So we did try computers, we tried um, small netbook style computers uh, for some years in schools, very good, nice things to use, very robust, low cost, but still not low enough cost and not low enough power for what's now come along. So where we're now at is in the, uh, in the tablet space, specially made tablets with a 9 hour battery life, 32 gigs of memory and so on. Um, that have got uh, Wi-Fi or 3G if you want it. And now we're also looking at the smartphone market uh, as well, going for the lower end. At the moment, most people in this country, you'll be pleased to hear, have got one of these. Again, the trusty $12 Nokia. Can't go wrong with that. What we need to do is have everybody now owning one of these instead. 
I don't care whose it is. <laughs> These are $35. And you can stick a 32 gig SD card in there, and suddenly you've got all of your learning available. Um, so we, we can talk about that. Uh, just because this is a group of techies, I assume, I thought we'd better have a picture of our little droid friend here. <laughs> So no internet access is required. Every one of those lessons uh, is sitting on this tablet. Um, so all you have to do when you're at school is just to touch, we'll go to that same lesson to start with, touch on your grade. So I'm in Mrs. Peary's class. And there are your lessons for today. Those lessons are all stored on this device. And that is now being spoken uh, just the same as you would have seen it there. So the children are hearing it. All uh, lessons are spoken as well as written. And they are all available in uh, at those early grades in nine languages. So it's been quite a big job to do that. First time anything like that has been done. And we're now actually looking at doing it for other countries around the region. There is a, uh, three versions of this. It's a home version. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. <laughs> that's Mrs. Droid, and that's her daughter, Android. <laughs> nice picture. So there's a home version where everything is taught on here, but there's also homework. Uh, and there's also um, adult literacy and numeracy and a bunch of other good things as well. And connectivity. Uh, there's a school version that you've just seen, and there's also a teacher version. And we expect the teacher to also have one of these small, low-powered LED projectors, which can also run off a battery. So everything here can be run off power, and here we've got a much more serious version of our droid friend. Uh, so we've been testing it in schools for the last two and a half years, very successfully in terms of increasing our numeracy and literacy, and most importantly of all, the children have actually been having fun, and therefore they keep coming to school, um, which was not certainly always the case before. Um, the teachers are saying some good things, and I'll leave you to look at that afterwards. So we're selling it for around about that price, or we will do when we launch it next month, which works out to some of those figures. In this country, I'm not allowed to talk to you about dollars, uh, but just for the sake of those who... And that looks like a Cronus, and I'm sorry about that, but that's a uh, rebased price yet. Right. Those of you who would like to sit in Finland and learn Tonga, this is your big chance. <laughs> because it's available on the net uh, with a PayPal interface, and free in this country for people who happen to be on the iConnect network. Lastly, really, and very importantly, we've put a sustainability component into this. So we're putting a lot of effort into creation of material for small-scale and subsistence farmers and for health workers. So again, in English and vernacular, readable by people who've got very low levels of literacy, uh, but knowing how to improve their productivity, how to improve their uh, animal keeping and so on and then take it to market in conjunction with the fact that we've got connectivity uh, when we need it. Uh, the same in the health area. And as I say, we're looking now to expand that out to some of the other countries around the region, translating into uh, Swahili and Sutu and various other languages. So there we are. The Zambia is first. We believe that there's nothing else like this anywhere in terms of something that is both creative for the teachers but also very prescriptive. Every lesson plan in primary is on here. So it's telling the teacher what to do all the way through primary education. So if you happen to start a school uh, with a, a, an untrained farmer in a rural area, we still think that those children are getting a high quality of international style education. Uh, and that's what we set out to do. I think I just about to get to that 10 minutes, but thank you very much. Now, uh, Yussi is from Nokia. Um, who do indeed make the vast majority of phones in this country. I have no idea how profitable that is, but... Um, <laughs> and they last for an awfully long time. Uh, they're really good. Particularly, the, the most important feature, forget Android, is the fact that they've got a flashlight. <laughs> that counts for an awful lot. Um, and previously, you were working in Mozambique. Yeah. Advising the minister and... Uh, elsewhere. Yes, we're going to be at the time. Is that right? Right, sorry. <coughs> okay, let's go ahead. So I have to warn you a bit. I just came from the from the airplane an hour back, so I'm a little bit tired, but uh, let's keep on going. So actually, I'd like to understand a bit better that who you actually are. So uh, how many of you are education sector specialists? Can you just uh, put your... Um, okay. And how 
public developers. <coughs> okay? All right, and the government, the government guys, NGOs. All right, okay. All right, so I was given a task of first, uh, basically to tell you in a few uh, minutes about Nokia strategy, talk about the impact of mobility, to talk about M learning, and to talk about the developer opportunity. All, all that in the end. So let's see where we get. Um, so uh, basically, I'm going to start with a very, very brief uh, description of uh, a summary of, uh, of, of Nokia's, Nokia's strategy. But um, as, 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 uh, as Mark explained, I, I've been living on the, uh, in, in Africa uh, for, uh, for about roughly about eight years. Uh, worked with the UNDP, uh, worked, uh, started working with Nokia in South Africa, spent uh, quite a few years in Mozambique, have been very much uh, working uh, with uh, how to catalyze and stimulate innovation in Africa, have been uh, spearheading in uh, initiatives like uh, Open Innovation Africa Summits and uh, M Labs in South Africa, uh, labs in, in, uh, in uh, Nigeria and Egypt, uh, uh, Kenya as well. So have been very much working in this innovation space. Uh, trying to get uh, and, and support you guys who are, who are uh, future future entrepreneurs of this continent. But let's go ahead. Uh, so basically, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nokia's strategy, a bit more about about mobile and development, uh, uh, um, M learning, a uh, bit of the opportunity, and actually what's uh, what, what kind of support Nokia can provide for for developers, especially when you're looking at uh, at, um, at the education sector. So in 2011, Nokia made a very brave and big decision to change our strategy completely. So until then, we had uh, been very much committed to our own platforms, uh, platforms like Symbian uh, and, and so forth. We had been developing our own platforms called Meager and so forth. But at the point uh, then, we realized that actually we were falling behind. We had been, uh, we had been too arrogant. We had been uh, sort of thinking that we know exactly what the consumers want. But then the touchscreen the revolution took off, even though we had had our touchscreen devices 10 years before in the laboratories and guys had been playing with them for ages, but we didn't believe in them uh, that the market would be ready. So, so in 2011 we had to make a very tough decision and to leave much of our software development behind. And then uh, we made a decision that in the smartphone space we were very much uh, dedicating uh, our efforts to support uh, the growth of the Windows phone ecosystem. The second piece then, uh, and uh, basically the Windows Phone ecosystem is are these devices, what you see here, uh, uh, Lumia devices uh, that we've been now launching. And I'm going to show you a very, very short uh, short video now about uh, about an announcement that we just made uh, made last week, just to give you a bit of a touch about what we are, what we are talking. So that's an example of, uh, of what Nokia has been doing over the past few years, really trying to get uh, get its act together and, and introduce the most innovative uh, smart devices on the market. But then at the same same time, uh, you know, uh, Nokia has been always con uh, very very much committed to the to the emerging markets. We've been working in this space for the past 20 years, connecting people. Really meant for connecting everyone on this planet, not just the top tier of the economy, not just the five to ten percent, but basically everyone. So we were very, working very much on this space, and there was an announcement last week uh, about uh, about our, our latest innovations in this space, and I'm going to show that video quickly as well. This is an example of, of a low-end device that is very much focusing on markets like India, uh, Africa, Uh, about uh, Nokia's uh, current 
portfolio. And where are we? Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead. So um, very, very brief intro about, about Nokia, where we are at the moment. Exciting things happening, and we are very confident about uh, things to come over the coming 12 months. You saw some of that stuff here. But what is really driving, uh, driving let's say, much of my own work uh, in, in, in Africa and Middle East and India is, is about actually what is the impact that mo mobile technologies have for national development. And uh, when I was working as an advisor to the minister in Mozambique, one of the big challenges always was that how do we actually justify investments in ICT? Because ICT was seen as a luxury, it was not seen as, as a development tool. But I think that finally over the past few years we've been uh, getting uh, factual research on, on what actually is the impact of increased, in, increased mobility, increased penetration for national productivity. And uh, Nokia did actually this study itself uh, or in 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, but then World Bank repeated it uh, a, year, a year later. It's very, very exciting, exciting research. But what is even, even more interesting is then the, actually the indirect impact that mobile technologies have on societies, so how they make things more efficient. And what you can see here, this is another study by McKinsey, which shows that when the penetration level goes up, uh, typically the, uh, the traditional uh, teleoperators, apologies, teleoperators and the telecom sector, the share of the GDP very much remains the same. But what actually happens then is the end user surplus, where the penetration goes up, actually starts growing much faster. And what that basically means is the increased mobility of the workforce, it's your taxi drivers, it's your agricultural producers, it's your teachers, everyone else actually start generating much, much, much more. So what this means is that we have to see that ICT is not just mobile technology, but ICT in general are a strategic tool for national development. And we have to mainstream these technologies to those, to those strategies that we have. And this is one, one, one thing that I've been, I've been advocating myself very passionately. But what is the problem what we have? Uh, if, we, if we listen to the ITU and we listen to the World Bank, we listen to much of the, of the researchers uh, about, uh, about mobile tech, it's stats that 50% of the continent is connected, but that actually that is not true. That is uh, statistic, statistical data that comes from the, sub, the subscription uh, data of operators and, and, the, and, the, and the regulators. The reality is that, uh, that the penetration level is much lower. It's uh, somewhere around 25% to 30% if we look at across the continent. So this is a statistics that we uh, we have put together ourselves. The big number up there up there means how many people today have their mobile handset and can access mobile technologies. Basically, it means of connectivity. And then the big, the smaller figure is in the figure that is typically reported as the as the penetration level. So let's take an example of a country like Kenya, which is very very often hailed as the as the as the hub for mobile level development on the continent, which it is. But still, uh, the, the official statistics by the government is 75, 34% of, of the population actually is connected. If you look at then, then, then Zambia, the figure here is, is according to this, uh, this uh, statistics at the end of 2000. It comes from uh, multiple operators, people having multiple SIM cards, and of course some part of the population having multiple devices as well. And then there's also this churn of people changing operators and, and so forth. So this is something, what, is a, what, what it means is that we are still far from universal access on this content. So we have to be working on how do we get everyone connected, everyone online. That's also very important when we, when we look at uh, the penetration levels that we should not be looking only at, at, at voice connectivity, SMS connectivity, but we have to be looking at data connectivity. Because what we just heard about, it will not work uh, uh, until we have, have data connectivity. An example of some of the countries that have been growing faster than the others, they have prioritized ICTs as a tool for national development. Ghana, Senegal, uh, Kenya uh, are some of, the, some of the model countries. And you can see here also for the impact of, of the taxation, what it has had for, for increasing, increasing the penetration growth. Actually, Zambia is not doing badly, but it's still, uh, uh, still if you look at the acceleration of Kenya and so forth, or Ghana, uh, it is still, still quite a bit, uh, bit behind. But I think that great work has, has, has been done in that sense here as well. But let's go ahead. So mobile learning, my next topic. So uh, this is about the project that, uh, that uh, Nokia started uh, in 2008 in South Africa. And, uh, and we actually got a, uh, we got a request from, uh, from the Deputy President of, uh, of South Africa. He came to us and said that, that uh, what can we do? We have very high penetration in the country. We have a lot of devices. Uh, basically, people have ICTs in their hands, but we are not using it eff efficiently for doing anything else. We're not adding value to the education sector. We are not using it as a tool for learning. Basically, we took, we took that task to ourselves and we started thinking about as a corporate social responsibility initiative, not as a business initiative, what can we actually do? What can we do to 
codify and digitalize uh, the learning experience. And basically what we came up with was, was a cloud-based uh, cloud service which can be used both in the formal education sector as well as, as an informal sector too. And the interesting thing now over the past few years is that we have realized that actually the education sector or fixing of it uh, can be done and should be done of course through the formal sector, working with education institutions and teacher training institutions and so forth. At the same time, you should be offering also in the informal space solutions that really support and, and, and make, that, uh, make that solution more, more holistic. So we started building then, then a system that uh, basically uh, tries to digitalize much of, the, much of the critical learning experience what you have. So, different, uh, so for the one, one uh, let's say, a good example typically is that much of the e-learning was, was traditionally based on people pushing data, pushing information from a central source to the learners, where the learners themselves, they find what is interesting for them, they, they find, uh, find uh, uh, knowledge packages which are, which are grouped by a level of difficulty. They can be looking at, of course, the theoretical research, but they can also be competing with each other. They can even start competitions and test uh, uh, tests within the community, or that the teacher of course, can be uh, able to continuously monitor how the students are doing. What is also interesting about this, uh, this solution is that the teachers have, of course, 24-7 access to the statistical data about what the students have been doing. What is interesting about this as well is that it works on your simplest mobile handset with GPRS uh, capability. It doesn't have to be a Nokia, it can be anything else as well. So basically, your devices from 20 US dollars upwards uh, can access the cloud service. Uh, so the only requirement is that it has data connection. So unfortunately, SMS data, premium SMS, this is not a sort of solution for this. But uh, if we look at the, that how many people we can reach, with, uh, with uh, this sort of approach is already pretty pretty high, uh, especially considering that people are sharing their devices, especially within, within households. So uh, in a rural family, if the father or mother has a device, the children can also be using it and, and accessing it. And this is where we, where we really uh, what we tried to do here was that let's use technology that people already have access to. So we don't have to purchase, we don't have to buy anything, but let's use a technology that people have already in their hands. If you look at the, the, the mobile handset, not maybe this one, but, uh, <laughs> but let's take, uh, take any other one like this one. It's got the computing power of, uh, of Apollo uh, landing, uh, landing station uh, of the 19, 1960s. So basically you have a computer, massive amount of power in your pockets uh, uh, already today. So why not use that, that uh, power what you already have? Uh, and I think that, that when we look at the formal education sector, it's, fu it's fundamentally important that we look at technologies like, uh, like tablets, uh, like Fadlets, which is a kind of a of those of the device and, and the tablet, but we can also be, uh, be looking at the informal space. And this is also a challenge actually for you guys who are developers. So you should only be looking at how they access the global international markets and make the big bucks, but there's actually a lot of work to be done in the local context, in the African context as well. And that's actually my, my next topic. So if you look at very quickly, there's a massive transformation going on in the markets now. Year 2013 is the first year when there, there's actually more uh, mobile devices on, the, on, on this planet than there were PCs uh, previous, previously. So this was kind of the, this is the watershed year now. So we should be using those, those, uh, those technologies that, uh, that exist. Excellent. If you look at the, the, the transformation of the continent from basic phones to smarter phones to smartphones, and what these smarter phones really are now here, these are devices which can be used for services like the Nokia Mobile Mathematics. And let's go back. So, so if you look at the percentages now, from 2011 to 2017, there's a big change. Now if you look at from smartphones uh, at the level of about 16, 17% of the entire, entire volume base, and of course you need to remember that this is biased because uh, we have South Africa, we have Egypt and so forth in these numbers. But then the, the feature phone space is, 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 uh, is, is, is very big, basic phone space very big as well. But basically all the way from top here to bottom here, you can actually be already accessing uh, uh, internet-like services and, and introducing value-added service for the consumer. All right, so this is uh, uh, still about the opportunity space. So uh, in, in uh, our estimation, actually the industry estimation, not ours, is about 6.2 billion US dollars of value added services is going to be the market size in Middle East and Africa, which once again means that there's massive opportunity for local developers to be actually uh, 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 introducing service themselves. 
And one thing that I've been talking about a lot, the door is open currently for African developers. It's not going to be that, that, uh, that, that's not going to be the case for the next five to ten years. We're going to see the, uh, the door being open now for the next few years. But after that, the global value-added service, uh, service uh, industries and, 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 uh, and the companies will start investing much more on the content, which is going to create much more com competitive space here. But guys who are now developers setting up your companies, it's, it's, it's now your moment. Good. And the last thing, uh, just pitching a little bit about uh, what kind of support we, are, we guys are giving, giving for the developers. So there's a program called App Campus that we set, uh, set up uh, together with, uh, with Microsoft and Alta University. So we've set up uh, 21 million euros of, uh, of money uh, into a separate fund that, uh, that provides support, financial support for developers anywhere around the world. And we're just in, uh, just next week in, in East, uh, East, uh, East London in South Africa, we are launching a program where we are, where we are using African innovation hubs for channeling talent to this program. So the, basically the way, the way it's going to work is that there's different, three different type of awards, 20,000, 50,000 and 70,000 euros. We don't take any IP, we don't take any rights of that, uh, of that innovation. So this is very much focusing now on Windows Phone and Java innovations. Uh, and, uh, and the only condition what we have is that the innovations that get access to the program are unique, they are new, and there's an ex exclusivity of 90 days on the store that these are only uh, on, on Windows Phone and Java. But basically after that, you can do whatever you wish with that. So basically free, free, free cash, 20, 50, 70, just to catalyze the, the emerging innovation ecosystem in emerging markets. Um, I think that takes me to the end. <laughs> a few topics. Thank you so much. Yes, hello everybody. Nice to be here. Do you know what happens when I come from cold Finland? We have had wonderful winter from minus 20 to minus 40. And I come to Africa and catch cold. <laughs> <laughs> Don't understand. Uh, my name is Risto Jamperan and I'm working for Elisa Corporation, which is the telecommunication and ICT uh, corporation and, and uh, we have uh, almost 4,000 people working on and, and uh, turnover is good enough and a little bit profits as well. So <laughs> trying to survive on the market. We are mainly working just in, uh, in, in Finland, Estonia, Russia, <coughs> Sweden, not in Africa. I personally have been working in South Africa uh, from 2008 for education and with the government and live, understand a little bit what, what's going on here. Now we have been three days in Lumbana and, and uh, preparing a cooperation between Finnish and, and, and Zambian entrepreneurs. So like, like uh, Jussi said, uh, I believe that it's really time for developers here in Zambia. But, but I believe as well that it could be a time for developers outside Africa to develop things in Africa so they could be your competitors so who don't know but what we are looking from Finnish and Zambian cooperation that can we work together find some good ways to do that and, and uh, add value to the things what, what we are doing but let's see we are in the very very beginning a little bit about uh, let's try no right hand button all technology is so different. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what Elisa and, and I'm mean looking at this as a spider, wider perspective as well. We, what we are doing in, uh, uh, we are looking for 21st century service design or new services, new ways to do things. And I think, like, uh, was it Mark who said that? that uh, that uh, you, you have to rethink how the teaching is to, uh, happening at the moment. I believe that the teaching has to be changed because learning has changed due to the technology and what we have had in hands. So my, in our company, that's my role. We are looking for new ways, new innovations, new, new ways to do things in, a, in another way where technology is involved. The other thing what uh, Many people, maybe especially you as developers are doing, are looking for new services and new development tools. And what's happening on this area is the virtual uh, chains. And virtual chains is the biggest chain 
change what is happening, especially in this education environment. You know, like, I guess everybody knows that Finland has been a long time number one education country in the world. But uh, Singapore, South Korea, Canada, they are as well good on that. But what is the difference with the, for example, with, with the Singaporean school is that they are using a lot of technology within a school room environment, in, on the environment where they are doing it. But they are not using virtual tools or anything like that. And that will be the biggest change in, I guess, in uh, everything, in healthcare, education, and, and uh, actually in everyday life. Then uh, we have a service production. In South Africa, we tried how the cloud services are running, and they seem to work quite well. So we developed things between the South African guys and our Finnish guys, but we had the production environment in Finland. So we tried how it, it <coughs> we put that on, on the air, or actually under the sea nowadays. So and, and pick up in, in uh, South Africa, in Kimberley, and divided that uh, we meet together with the local companies and network to rural environment. Try is that global networking uh, is that working and it, it was working really well. So we believe that very much for the uh, let's say cloud services uh, for the future. So uh, that was quite interesting. This uh, mobile one, these topics that uh, that make a positive change and think what will happen next and why. Uh, what, what if it will not happen? So <clears throat> that virtually it is a very important thing to make this guy happy as well. So uh, there will be in the future what we are doing and, and selling in uh, from Finland and you are the, for, for for example these uh, uh, kiosk environments for consumers. You don't need, but especially what's happening more and more is within the the healthcare or how we could say that welfare for older people and, and uh, not depending on the age where virtuality comes to the game so you don't have to leave your mother or father alone and you can know that somebody is taking care of him or her the other big change which is near uh, near my heart is the education so that will the virtuality is the big thing coming on the education and that will change the way of working. We are working uh, with, if you have heard about the Dream School. Dream School is a new approach for learning, which changes the way of teaching to learning and, and you know, learning environment. And the question is that what is the best way to learn? And we have uh, built up the Dream School concept together with the uh, Kaunian and uh, school, which is the small school uh, near the Helsinki area, and the results of that school has been so great. So the, the let's say the motivation people are students are so motivated there, and we can compare. That's it's very e easy way to try that as well in Zambia. Will that concept uh, be working here? Uh, I would like to show you an. an hope that you will take a think uh, what is your role in the change in the future and I will finish on that one please try to take on that screen there or try to find out, out this and please think is that the change <coughs> and what is your role and do you believe it will go on that way
Find new working practices to change how their life is going on to and innovate. I am uh, acting as a vice president for Finnish Society of Television and Ethan. And uh, also, uh, my current designation is as a development director for Corpio Innovation, that is a uh, kind of a business development organization in Finland. And uh, uh, yeah incubating new companies, helping new developers to form companies and to get the companies grow and to find new markets abroad, different countries for their products and find uh, cooperation in different fields. We are also coordinating the Human Security Finland network, so in that sense we are also part of the organizations here. And uh, also I'm a developer. I have been kind of a, one part of one of these Nokia's development programs. I'm the founding member of Nokia Developer Champion program back in uh, 2006, perhaps. That is uh, one option for you, for all you. And the picture behind there, I thought uh, it would be fair because uh, we are arriving at the winter time in here in Zambia, and I think actually that is the uh, best Finnish summer weather here at the moment. <laughs> so the picture is from Finnish winter time, that is from my backyard in the winter. At the moment when the picture was taken, it was minus 30 degrees there. Uh, and uh, I'm talking to you about some possibilities in mobile health and uh, kind of uh, as I'm an engineer, electric engineer, medical technology, you will see some gadgets uh, connected to different things and taking out of uh, information. I like <coughs> you to think, especially the developers here, how to utilize that that has already been done in recent years. Uh, I say it's in scale of 20 years back today and how to accommodate that to future things what we have been just seeing in here. So just a few words about our society. We are NGO, the society. Uh, we are the second one in the world after American Telemedicine Association, the first one in Europe. And we are also the founding members of the International Society of Telemedicine and eHealth. 
that is the kind of the uh, federation of telemedicine in the world. They like to say that uh, they are the, like the UN in telemedicine. They, may, they have a, over 74 different countries as uh, nation members in the society. But uh, as I learned, Zambia doesn't have yet any organization or any uh, cluster or any other that are members in this, any formal kind of group that are enhancing this kind of uh, solutions. Our main goal as a society is to promote the use of ICT in the health sector, how to provide services and products through ICT. And we have a lot of uh, cooperation in, uh, of course, in our nation and also international. And the members of the society, that's interesting because there are companies, there are developers, there are healthcare professionals, there are different uh, other NGOs and also private persons, developers and other private persons that are just interested in the topic. So kind of different, uh, uh, kind of many different actors in different fields with different backgrounds uh, in the society. And I think that is very fruitful because what different kind of ideas are coming up in that sense. Uh, and this is our recent achievement in Finland and also in Europe. Uh, we created kind of special competence of electronic healthcare for the physicians, for the doctors. And as you know, when the physicians, they have uh, completed the studies for medical doctors, they can still uh, increase the special knowledge uh, by uh, applying different special competencies. And now there is electronic healthcare competence in Finland that doctors, medical doctors, you have to be a medical doctor can apply, uh, that is something that is not available in any other European countries at the moment. So we are forerunners in this. And uh, just to remind you what is e-health and what is m-health. So basically e-health, the e, electronic health, that is the use of information and communication technology, ICT, for health for health services, for distant care. And the M health, that is kind of the subs, sub, uh, sub area of the E health, that is almost the same, but is, that is the use of mobile information and communication technologies for it. You would not think of that as a wireless word, so you don't have any cables connected and transferring the information. So that is the context that we are going through. Uh, one slide about the status in Finland, where we are when talking about electronic health. The Finland is one of the forerunners <laughs> in, in the world in this sector, in good and bad. We have so long history that we have so much different kind of electronic services available and uh, there is little messed up cocktail at the moment with different services available. But even though we have 100% coverage of electronic patient reports in the country. So every uh, hospital, every clinic, public or private, they are using electronic health records. So storing all the patient information into one record, etc. Also, for the imaging such radiology, fully digital data exchange between organizations, almost good, but not so good in the uh, health center level. That is something that has been a kind of a problem that uh, I suggest you when you start to develop uh, e health or m health solutions here, keep in mind always, always, always that the data should be in kind of standard format, an open format, that it can be transferred between different kind of systems. 
do not make just closed systems that this is just for this purpose and cannot be used for that purpose because I can tell from Finnish experience that that is not good. <laughs> you can learn from that. Uh, and that there are different kind of remote tele services that are available at the moment. But then I thought that uh, I take you through journey that I have been myself been uh, from 1998 to 2009 when I was developing for different companies mobile health applications also other applications but I was actually doing the coding and the software then this is the first one the very first smartphone based full mobile teleradiology solution so you know when you are going to the hospital and they are taking x-ray or <coughs> complete tomography or uh, magnetic resonance image of you uh, the pictures are like this there are slices from your head there can be uh, uh, 50 images from your head and they are looking if you have some cancer or some other problems in your head and sometimes the doctor at the hospital they cannot say is there a problem or not they need to cancel so we developed a system where they can send the images or what of images they are using at the moment at that time GSM network it was very fast <laughs> 9600 bits per second with an image when sending radiology images to it was a Nokia communicator, grayscale communicator that uh, the backup uh, specialist on call had so the doctor who was consulting they could be at home or wherever they were the images were sent to the mobile terminal and they could do review the images, they could zoom the images, they could view the patient data there and uh, see what is wrong and also go back to the hospital and tell what to do next. Uh, the other way around would be that either the patient would be sent to other hospital or they would call the specialist somewhere and please come to the hospital to review the images. So this saved actually I know one case that it saved one line at least. And um, another version was in the year 2003, it was a Windows pocket PC at the time. Full touch screen faced. Mm -hmm. It is not new invention. But the problem with these pocket PC devices was that because uh, they didn't have a, a, a RAM memory that lasts uh, when you battery runs out so every time when the battery ran out they had to install software again and again but even though it was nice to write another kind of software that we did you can see the old phone models here that was uh, back back in there this was kind of smartware so kind of clothes that had intelligence inside so same source when you were the uh, clothes they connect actually to your mobile phone collects information your muscle activity at this moment at this application they collect the information from your back muscles if you have some problems in your back etc and it could be transferred of course to the some fitness portal and that there could be some personal trainer or coach related for that another 2006, again, <coughs> mobile phone at the center, at, uh, in the, either at the patient home or the nurse uh, carried these devices at the mobile phone when uh, she visited the patient and took the measurements. And all the measurements were documented automatically, electronically, mobile phone then again the cleaning for the doctors and actually the doctor can give feedback right back again sleep up sleep up at least this is a kind of 
large problem in uh, Finland at least. So uh, when you are sleeping, uh, time to time you stop breathing. So that is not so good. That's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, your mobile phone and then small sensors you could wear when you are sleeping could be used to monitor what is happening to you when you are sleeping. And if there's something problem, uh, if you stop breathing, this uh, must measure really your oxygen saturation. So if you stop breathing for a certain time, the oxygen saturation drops quite very fast. And uh, then the mobile phone can notice that and it can wake you up, start to ring or something or something or something. Or just to collect the data during the night and after the night the doctor can review the data and see if there is something wrong with you. Okay. At the disaster site. We had a one time kind of disaster uh, what is a disaster pack where you put the people to keep warm warm. There was integrated a small sensors in the pockets of the that uh, and also a small smart smartphone in there. When there was a disaster, the paramedics they could just put the small wireless devices uh, for the patients and all the monitoring uh, collected automatically and uh, sent either to ambulance for kind of central monitor or directly to the hospital for information. I know that. Uh, one hour technology was used uh, during the tsunami in the, where was it, Thailand? When the, after the tsunami, when they tried to recognize the people there, there was a Finnish uh, dentist collecting the information from the teeth from the people, and they used our technology to collect the images and send back to the Finland. And the Finnish people make kind of a, analysis of who this might be because there was so they were so badly damaged that they couldn't be recognized otherwise. Okay? For some cases it could be useful to detect if person falls, for example <laughs> elderly, elderly people or disabled people. If they fall, if you carry mobile phone, they are packed with different kind of sensors nowadays. Back then, there were no, not so many sensors inside, but there were accelerometers. So you could tell if the uh, person falls and doesn't get up in certain time. You would, in a just a simple algorithm, you could do that and then send alarm to some help to get some help. Nowadays, the mobile phones are full of different kinds of sensors. You have GPS, you have, a, uh, of course, a thermometer. You might have a, even a, the sensor that notice if you are putting the phone here. Light sensors, uh, Bluetooth, you can just monitor if there are other people around you. I know that uh, some solutions are using the Bluetooth uh, uh, sensor to notice if there are other people to help certain people that have some anxiety that uh, they are fear of places where a lot of people so the phone is actually helping you through that kind of uh, guiding different uh, routes and etc. Kind of context awareness. One nice idea was uh, Iron Man triathlon in Germany that is one of the hardest, toughest triathlons in the world that uh, uh, done and there was one group of diabetics that uh, wanted to do the triathlon and you know if you're diabetic and you are doing very stressful uh, sports your blood sugar level must be maintained very well or otherwise you will be knocked out. There was actually mobile phone in the back pocket of the first glucometer uh, was put on the handlebars of the bike and also small device to collect the information from Google the mobile phone to send to the doctor who monitored the event. So actually the 
cycle there took plug glucose measurements during the ride. So just small sample plug measurement, say to the doctor, everything okay. There's also a headset if there was something wrong, the doctor would call immediately and say that no stop or go around. Different kind of shows. Mobility. Yeah. Mobility, you know. The heart tells everything. You can measure it. Pain monitor. You can tell if you are in pain. And uh, how these technologies could be adapted for different uh, life situations. I can say that it goes from womb to tomb when you are born all the way to grave. It can follow every your life steps. But the problem with that is uh, perhaps why I'm at the business development side nowadays and not develop any motor solutions is that even though there are a lot of good solutions available, why do not people use them? Why do not people do as they are told to do? Why they are not taking care of their health? Uh, there is something, motivation, I think. And then comes the games. Games are something that people like to play. They play again and again and again for some reason. Again and again for some reason. And downloading new content for some reason. But they are not using health applications again and again and again, again downloading new content. Again. But what if we can combine these two? Take these uh, game aspects and health aspects together. What would that be? This is one example that was also my experience back then. Trying to, I connected my muscle activity to control the snake again. That was a hit back. Long time ago, you know. If you just uh, used your bi <laughs> bicep, right bicep, the, the, worm, the snake turned left, right, and uh, <laughs> left bicep. <laughs> when you are doing it, it didn't, it wasn't enough if you just waved your hand. You, know, you had to use your muscle. When you are using 10 minutes your muscles like this and playing, it feels like a one hour a gym exercise, I can tell you. And we already heard that we have been here uh, a little time discussing with Sampion and we found, as I mentioned earlier, that there are no uh, kind of formal group or formalized way uh, coordinating events in Zambia that relates to electronic health services or mobile health services. I know there are a lot of different kind of projects and acts and starts uh, in different parts of the country, but no one is, uh, as I have learned, is coordinating all these events towards the same goal. So, I'm suggesting that and calling for developers alone to create and form Sampian M Health or E Health cluster to form to found a kind of a way together with the actual people.